Our love is stronger than the world's most pungent pickle. Won't you dive into the brine with me? F Class Gaming! We are back and we have multiple vengeances. We're taking names. We're kicking butt, we're shooting first and asking questions somewhere down the road and not in chronological order. I'm joined, as always, I must say, I got the Rev. Uh, I am the Reverend, that is who I am. I got Mandy. <laughs> and I got this cool dude. Just Josh. Yep. We're two uh, blue hoodie bros. This is green, man. What? That looks blue. That's blue. It's green. I bought it for him. I'm a professional, so I'll work past it. Now, I want to take a moment to address the elephant in the room. Don't know how we got it in here. Door's way smaller than the elephant, and yet, here it is. I know. The it's, elephant's right here. It's ridiculous. Look, two episodes ago, somebody hacked into the site and uploaded a pirated version. And as a result, we had to then subsequently move to our half-glass gaming underground bunker. The equipment quality wasn't that great. But we are professionals. And as we have committed to uh, bring you the greatest gaming-related podcast known to man. We had to just bite the bullet and go with it. Last two episodes, sound quality wasn't that great, and I just hit my Jimmy John's rapper while I said that. So that's what you heard there. That's not a hiccup in the sound quality. I fucked up. But needless to say, we're back, and we sound fantastic. My voice, it's just so voluptuous. I don't think that's a term that describes voices. It does. I'm. You could kind of funnel it a bit and, and <laughs> probably be able to tell that. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's voluminous. I mean, voluminous is, is a better term for a voice <laughs> than voluptuous. So apparently this morning, Julian ate a thesaurus and... <laughs> <laughs> Can I say I'm getting back into the rap game. For listeners who don't know, Julian is quite the rapper, has some albums out. Yeah, I did three three records, and uh, all of them were produced almost entirely using uh, video game beat programs. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. First two were MTV Music Generator Volume 2, and the second one also had um, Digital Hits Factory, hosted by Funkmaster Flex. And the third one I used, the uh, Rockstar Beaterator. I officially hit over 2,500 hours in Skyrim. Wow. Clearly, I am the more impressive one. You should make a rap album about that. I should. <laughs> <laughs> My dog almost died, too. Oh, yeah, really? Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I, I, I saw that it managed to self-heal right before a $3,000 procedure, so that yeah. was good. Yeah, no shit. His ass really <laughs> saved me on that one. <laughs> But he's cool. So yeah, I'm a proud papa, you know, of a healed dog. Proud papa of a healed dog in a rap career. You know, but enough about me and my woes and my accomplishments. It's shining and numerous as they are. What's up with the rest of the gang? I um managed to get a working Super Nintendo finally. One that plays something other than Donkey Kong? Yes. I got invited, actually by, by you, Julian, I got invited to a Facebook group that's, yeah. you know, Minneapolis area retro gaming. There's some drama in that group man. Yeah. society there was some drama <laughs> it's a group on the internet right uh facebook well so of course there's drama yeah <laughs> there's a guy on there selling a super nintendo and i was like i was like hey i got all the cables i got the controllers all i need is the box man and he's like i'll give it to you for 20 bucks and so he lives like eight blocks from me wow so we just drove over to his place one afternoon and he's like oh here you go i gave him a 20 and brought it home and everything works i played a little jurassic park mm -hmm. played a little mario paint mm -hmm. i wanted it to get harvest moon but that cartridge sells for like over a hundred dollars yeah. It's ridiculous. I think it's yeah. like 150 to 200 dollars if you Jeez. buy it from a collector. It's crazy. But instead of Harvest Moon, um, Stardew Valley, which we talked about on a previous episode, mm -hmm. came out in February, mm -hmm. the very end of February, and I've been playing that a whole bunch. It is everything exactly that I wanted it to now, be. What is that on? Um, PC. Okay. And Josh named his character Awesome Joe. <laughs> yeah, my character's <laughs> name Awesome Joe. Yeah. And then I named my dog Sniffer, and Mandy was. Was like oh that's so cute and i was like well it's short for 
butt sniffer. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll just be like, me and butt sniffer are going to do the- just so well. Be embarrassed. That's great. I've been very good at naming my characters in games lately. Mm-hmm. In uh, another game, I named my character the best. Because I I was hoping for that that piece of dialogue where they'll be like, oh, so I hear you're the best. The best. <laughs> and I was like, but it never happened. And mm. now they, they call me King the Best. And it's <laughs> it's very awkward. Yeah. Good. You deserve to have that be awkward. <laughs> that was a terrible thing to do for a horrible joke. And you mm-hmm. don't deserve to be happy I'm now. You make characters <laughs> after me, even when they're dudes. Yeah. Like, I'll play Harvest Moon and I'll be a male farmer named Mandy. And I just, <laughs> well, I like my name. Mandy Patinkin. That's a man. It's true. But he spells it with a man. Y. It starts, true, it starts with man. Yeah. Ends with D. <laughs> and Patinkin. No, but it felt really good to play Stardew Valley. Like, I was so happy. And I was making up little songs about Awesome Joe and all this <laughs> stuff. Um, right before I started playing Stardew Valley, I was on the phone with GoDaddy, oh. who is the worst. Some people are reporting that Retrovolve has problems on their work computers where mm-hmm. they have really tight security mm-hmm. measures. And mm-hmm. so I ran a bunch of scans. Everything checked out fine. The site's clean. But because I'm on GoDaddy and we share uh, an IP, we share a server with um, some other GoDaddy sites. It's not Pornhub, is it? No. Okay. Um, one of the sites on our IP got busted for selling a program that is selling lists of its users' email addresses, Hmm. which is considered spam, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they got blacklisted. GoDaddy took down their site. And it sounds like they recently reactivated that site. And so I called and was like, look, man, our site's getting blacklisted because somebody else on the server is doing something shady. I was like, you need to address that. And they're like, well, what do you expect us to do about it? It's like, well, you could move us to a different IP for one. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, we can't do that. Hmm. And it was basically basically telling me tough shit, man. I get really upset when, like, I pay for a service and the one service that I'm paying for, they refuse to get right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's your job to host my website, man. If I'm blacklisted and it's not my fault and my site checks out completely clean, like, you guys need to fix that. Yeah. I get really frustrated because I feel like there's this trend lately that I'm seeing in a lot of businesses that it's like, once they have you as a customer, if Mm -hmm. if it's any kind of subscription model at all... They are just like, fuck you, we're going to spend all of our time trying to get more customers. And it's like, well, once I'm a customer, you have an obligation to provide me the service that Mm -hmm. I'm paying for. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, like you don't need to be going out and getting more customers. You need to provide me with that service. And if you're not going to provide me with that service, then I need to pay someone else to do it and not you. I had a pretty frustrating conversation with the guy at GoDaddy about that. Mm -hmm. And then... Got on to Stardew Valley, and in the very beginning, the dude's sitting at a computer, and it's like, are you worn out by the stresses of life? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I am. And he, like, opens up this letter from his grandpa. It's like, well, you know, you can get away from the city and come take over my farm. And so I was, like, opening up the letter and just being so happy, like, yeah, I will get away from the stresses <laughs> of life. <laughs> Fuck you, go daddy. Yeah, I'm going to go build a farm. <laughs> It's crazy because it's not as if they're spending all their money on large-breasted models in their commercials anymore. So, you know, what are they doing over there? They used to have super weird ads. Yeah. Yeah, I remember there there was a few of their ads that ended up getting banned because they were just it was like, "Go, Daddy, come on, man." Yeah, softcore pornography. Have some have a commercial that actually has something to do with the service you offer, or in this case, don't offer. Apparently, yeah. I use Nixie Hosts. It's owned by people from Something Awful. They are great. Mm. I recommend them. Well, clearly Josh is all fired up, but uh, Mandy, you look a little fired up as well. Yeah. She's fire emblemed up. <laughs> <laughs> the new Fire Emblem came out in February. Exciting. Yeah, I love Fire Emblem. It's one of my favorite video game franchises. Mm-hmm. But people have been getting so weird about this game. Like, they're obsessed with the localization and that the localization is ruining the game or mm. that it's being censored. There is a campaign on Twitter, and I don't recommend 
recommend looking at this unless you're okay with seeing lots of gross racism and sexism and other things. But it's hashtag torrential downpour. Uh, hang on, and let it's, me just. Uh... It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> what is the what's the problem? What's the beef? Part of it is that there was a face petting mini game hmm. in the original game. It was very poorly received in Japan, and so uh, they took part of it out, mm-hmm. and so people reported that they took all of it out and all this content was cut from the game and what is cut is you don't randomly pat the faces of your soldier while they say what are you doing or mm, and like that feels good <laughs> yeah. so they took that out entirely now you just talk to your soldier which makes more sense mm-hmm. and then you can like pat the head of your spouse to wake them up out of bed mm-hmm. so that is what happened and then people started nitpicking every single thing about the localization in this game mm-hmm. and how it's terrible and ruined and the bizarre thing is most of the people clearly have never played a Fire Emblem game who are complaining about this. And then people are complaining about things that are in the original Japanese game. I think the funniest thing for me is there's a character named Hisame who Mm -hmm. is obsessed with pickles and he has a lot of really (laughs) weird lines about pickling and if he proposes marriage to you, he says, will you step into the brine with me? (laughs) Which I just think about sometimes and start laughing. And people were furious, but it's in the Japanese version. It's in the Japanese version, he's obsessed with pickling foods. Mm -hmm. and He's just obsessed with pickles. So that is the change. Mm. It's really an appropriate cultural change because people pickle a lot more foods Mm -hmm. in Japan than they do here, like Mm -hmm. plums or radishes. So that's it. But the thing that made me the maddest, actually, is I read some article complaining about it and the last sentence is, in Japan, Fire Emblem is a very serious series of little comedy. And they posted that article the same day the Beach Bash DLC came out in the US, which is when you have a fight with vegetable weapons with your family members to see who gets to go on a beach vacation. Mm-hmm. So like they just they don't know about Fire Emblem. Mm-hmm. They don't care about Fire Emblem. They just really want to be mad about this so-called censorship. And I just yeah. well, but Fire Emblem alone, man. I think listening to you describe it, I, I definitely think the racism is justified. So I will allow that. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I mean, I'm biting my tongue <laughs> right now. I'm, you know, it's like the, the racial slurs, whew, they're bubbling up. <laughs> when, I, when you hear the word pickle. Yeah. <laughs> I just get annoyed at people who don't understand what censorship actually is. I like Nintendo's a private company. Even if they did change stuff up to say, no, we don't want you to have the, the dirty language or whatever, that's still not censorship. Uh, Treehouse did the translation, which is Nintendo's uh, main in house localization company. They work with Nintendo of Japan mm-hmm. and all localization projects. Um, Intelligent Systems, which is a Nintendo-owned studio, develops Fire Emblem. And Intelligent Systems has actually fed them new English lines for their games before. So it's probable that Intelligent Systems... Well, I mean, it's for sure Intelligent Systems had to approve any changes that happened in this game. Mm -hmm. So it's the original team okaying localization changes and people still insisting something else happened. Mm -hmm. So, So it's not censorship twice over then. But there's like this weird kick right now. Uh, with some people on the internet where it's like we don't believe in censorship not even self censorship <laughs> yeah, those like, people are fucking stupid no but th- th- these are the people who are the loudest like who are super vocal about this stuff yeah, and apparently it's, really stupid people are really vocal about it then <laughs> it's absolutely insane it's complete insanity it's like s- self censorship isn't the censorship that everybody's against mm-hmm. like there was a, a transphobic joke in Pillars of Eternity, and I think I think it got into the game because there was a, like a competition or a contest. It was a Kickstarter kick, reward. Yeah, people okay, who, yeah. who paid the Kickstarter got to put something in the game. Yeah, and so one person put a transphobic joke, and the developers realized it after the game was out, and were like, "Oh shit, you're right. We don't want that in our game," and they took it out. And well, people they, were they, like, they "Asked the guy to submit something else." And so he did. But people so were, everybody agreed to this. Right. But people were furious. They're like, that's censorship. And it's like, no, it's not. Like, they realized something was in the game they made that they weren't comfortable with. And so they took it out. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not censorship. No. And I think um, we're beginning to sink our teeth, I think, into the main topic here. Before we do that and then shed massive amounts of blood, uh, I'm going to call for a break. Let, let's just settle down. Mandy, settle down. <laughs> 
With that, of course, I'd like to thank 2XAA and Wheelie for the music. Um, of course, Retrovolve.com. We don't sell your email information, okay? You can buy mine, but we don't sell yours. Of course, uh, w- w- you can also find a detailed list that's uh, right almost up to date uh, for all the episodes that uh, sort of lays out all the games that we talk about. Whether video or board, as it turns out, we have a couple board game mentionings in there as well. Uh, so when we get back, uh, we're going to talk about localization. And welcome back from the break. Look, we're talking about localization, okay? Which to me has always sort of just meant like translating dialogue, you know, but uh, there's more to it than that. Oh yeah, a whole lot more. Hmm. Um, With localization, sometimes you can do pretty close to a simple translation job, but even that involves doing massive amounts of coding because you can't just write a new script and put it in and say, okay, that's it. Like, Mm -hmm. especially if it's a Japanese game being localized because they use a different alphabet than we do. Mm -hmm. And so you have to program the game to recognize a different type of alphabet and make sure character codes match up. And that can be disastrous. Um, Trails in the Sky second chapter is a PSP game that was released in late 2015. And the reason that happened is because fixing the code to put in the English script was so difficult. They actually would get stuff like where purple blasts of light would appear coming Mm -hmm. out of characters' butts (laughs) when they tried to change the text in the game. So, I mean, you have to know how to program. And then there- Well, to be fair, that's a local thing. (laughs) (laughs) It's a benefit for the American audience. (laughs) But, uh, you know, you have to fix controls. Sometimes a really simple thing is that the confirm button in Japanese games is usually the circle button. Here, it's usually the X button. They don't always change that, but a lot of times that's swapped around. Yeah. Another thing that I've noticed from being on the showroom at E3 is a lot of Japanese games. Um, you know, people like to invert flight controls. Mm-hmm. So up is down and down is up. Oh, yeah. They like to invert left and right. Oh, is that right? Which is so confusing the first time you, like when you don't know about it and you try to play a game and you're like, what yeah. is going on? Yeah. But that's, Holy you know, that's, that's a cultural preference apparently. Hmm. Yeah, so it's tweaks to gameplay Mm -hmm. and then looking at things and figuring out whether or not it needs to be changed for the audience. Because, you know, Yakuza Mm -hmm. is a very Japanese game and people who play it want the experience of being in Japan. So you don't have to edit that many things. Right, you don't have to change the signs or the background, but just, yeah. But then in a game like Fire Emblem, that's for a very large audience, you Mm -hmm. have to edit a lot more so that it appeals to a broader crowd and so Mm -hmm. People get a better sense, and it's a weird line to figure out always how much. It's like it uh, 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 I used to love the Hot Shots series, um, and there was one level, maybe more, but one in particular. I can't remember what it was, but this goddamn fucking beetle sound that's particular to the region, I think, more specifically than it is here. Yeah, the cicada sound. Exactly. And if you watch Japanese programming, you will be yeah. very familiar with yeah, that every sound. Time I if you don't. Yeah, every time I see something now, it's like hot shots all over again. Yeah. For me, it's Evangelion that this... I did rah, 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 yeah. sound in the background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cicadas don't sound the same here as the Japanese cicadas do because I was really confused by that once and I'm like, I've never heard that sound and yeah. I, rem- I know I've seen cicadas before. So I like looked it up and American cicadas really do sound different hmm. from Japanese cicadas. I mean, I'm sure they're different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Japanese universe. cicadas speak Japanese. Yeah, yep. well, there you go. Wow. And then, you know, there are things like character names and uh, Japanese in particular uses a lot of onomatopoeia. Mm -hmm. And so like Koopa Troopers are called Noko Noko Mm -hmm. in Japan. And Noko Noko is just the onomatopoeia for walking around with no purpose, like Noko 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 Noko. And so they came up with something else that has some nice alliteration Mm -hmm. and is sort of catchy because you can't really translate that. We don't use onomatopoeia for everything like they do in Japan. And then there's the uh, accents where... uh, 
uh, Japanese, I'm given to understand, like, has a lot of different dialects and that will tell what region you're from. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times in, in English releases that gets translated as, oh, well, this character is going to have a southern accent. Mm -hmm. Or uh, in one game I played recently, Fairy Fencer F, uh, they gave a guy a, a very strong Canadian accent oh, yeah. in order to match the regional dialect that he spoke with in the Japanese. Mm. What's interesting is that when games get translated uh, into Japanese from English, they very rarely try to substitute dialects. So you wind up with scenes like the one in GTA with the Irish guy who nothing he says makes any sense. Yeah. And he's just speaking totally normally. And the guy is saying, why is he still saying like, why do you talk so weird? <laughs> but he's speaking normally. <laughs> so I mean, they yeah. probably should have localized that a little more. Yeah. But it's just not a common thing to do. That's funny. So what are examples of like some of the first games to be localized? Uh, the first game that I can find records of the localization process is actually Pac-Man. Hmm. And probably the biggest change they made was actually probably the name Pac-Man. He was originally called Puck-Man. Mm -hmm. And they, people in America said that might cause some issues. And it probably would have. Yes. Especially with little kids hanging out in arcades. Yeah. So Namco Smoking censored marijuana. it. Yes. They, <laughs> they censored his name and mm -hmm. changed his name to Pac-Man. And a lot of those really early games actually did have English text, even in the Japanese version, because hmm. uh, at the time it was just it was just easier to program English characters than Japanese characters because they needed to use so many more characters. So the cabinets would literally say Puckman <laughs> in Japan. Yes. In English. That was yeah, a does. subplot in uh, in the Scott Pilgrim movie. Hmm. He like was trying to impress people with his knowledge of that. <laughs> the Puck Man. Yeah. Oh, it is impressive. He's like, did you know Puck Man was original? Or <laughs> Pac Man was original? Like, it's a whole thing that he that he does a bunch of times in the movie. What a cool way to impress ladies. Yeah, that's a cool movie. The comic is way better. Mm. But uh, so a lot of those early games that have really bad uh, English translations were never really translated. They just straight up brought the Japanese version over and didn't localize it at all. Mm -hmm. Not the case with Pac-Man, mm -hmm. but with a lot of other games. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'd imagine back then there were probably a number of challenges. Localization is kind of a new thing and two different cultures that are now sort of trying to bridge this gap. Yeah, well, I mean, everything, localization isn't a new thing. Video game mm -hmm. localization is more complex, I would say, mm -hmm. than other types of localization. But everything gets localized. Almost everything. So, I mean, it's probably easier when you do run into the occasion when they just add subtitles and leave the Japanese language in. There are challenges associated with that, too. In Japan, voice actors are treated better than they are in a lot of other countries. It's a more prestigious job. Don't let Will Wheaton hear that. <laughs> So they have unions mm -hmm. and they get paid substantial royalties when their voices are used again. So in some games, particularly if they have better known voice actors, it's really expensive to pay the royalties and it is actually cheaper to hire people in the U.S. to record brand new voices mm. than it is to pay the royalties mm -hmm. to the Japanese voice actors. And so there will be situations where the original voices don't get left in, like with most Tales games, for example, and people will be really mad about it but it's just not in the budget so like for a game like yakuza let's say they bring it over here and they hire relatively well-known american actors to dub these uh, voices is that cheaper than even still to use the re re regular japanese voices it, it depends it depends on the actors largely if they're big name actors or actors with major voice acting unions it'll be a lot more expensive to pay mm -hmm. i think yakuza kind of got away from doing the dubs though i know yeah, yakuza, yakuza 5 was was completely in japanese and mm -hmm. it was subtitled which i thought was like i really liked that yeah that was the worst thing about the first one for me i mean i love like i said i love mark hamill you know but in the case of a series like Yakuza, it's actually more valuable for them to have Japanese voices than English voices. Whereas a game like the Tales series, you're going to need to have a dub anyway. So mm -hmm. it's like, should I pay for both or just pay for one? Mm -hmm. Well, an older... RPGs, man, it must have been a pain in the ass to do all that text coding over again. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of words in those games. But there are also times when they change even like the music. Right. right. Sometimes it's subtle differences, but uh, both the Famicom 
and Super Famicom had different sound chips mm -hmm. than they oh, did yeah. here, so sometimes you couldn't exactly replicate the music. And then there were other console differences too, like in the original Zelda, you know, you could kill enemies with voice commands, and the Nintendo didn't have, the NES didn't have voice commands, mm -hmm. so they had to come up with a gameplay change that worked here. Oh, that's crazy. Voice commands are super annoying in Tomb Raider. I don't use them. I had turned, it's like every time I did anything, sneezed or, you know, I mean, it's like, the game's pausing, it's bringing up the map, it's like switching my guns, it's like, what the hell? So localization, you know, it's a tight rope that's uh, not easily navigated. I'm sure there has to be some instances where it's just completely gone to shit. Yeah, and probably the most famous bad localization job is Zero Wing, which is the game All Your Base or Belong to Us is from. <laughs> I had always assumed that the game was written in English in Japan as well, mm -hmm. and so it was just a case of a script <laughs> that was written by a non-native speaker mm -hmm. being brought over here and that it was bad in both places. But that isn't actually true. It is a localized translated game. Uh, the Japanese script is really sloppy. There are grammatical errors that I can pick up. <laughs> My Japanese is very, very bad, and I'm not even close to any sort of fluency, and I can spot grammatical errors so mm -hmm. it is a very shoddily written script even in japanese mm -hmm. then almost certainly a non-native speaker did translate into english and i can't even imagine trying how to figure out how to translate something into a language you don't speak well when even the original stuff is kind of written like garbage it just <laughs> yeah. seems yeah impossible what did Jeez. you hear well i heard that they translated it in germany mm -hmm. by a, like a someone who is you know, mainly a German speaker. Mm -hmm. The person translating it wasn't fluent in English. The person who translated it certainly wasn't fluent in English. I couldn't find anything about that, but that doesn't mean it's not true. That's just that's just a rumor that I heard, and I've I've never really looked into it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what someone told me mm -hmm. a long time ago. Mm. But uh, the worst localization job I think I've ever seen was the game Lux Pain mm. on the DS. Mm -hmm. It's actually a really cool game, but they had like at least three different translations, and they're all sort of mixed together. So. So stuff will randomly change. Well, for one, the translation for the dub is completely different from the in-game script. And so people are saying different things and then stuff will change back and forth. Like characters' names will change. Sometimes characters' genders will change. And so suddenly they'll start like referring to somebody as he and like instead of she and like it's maybe doctor so-and-so. So you don't even know. And then it's like, well, I can't keep track of this person. Are there two doctors with the same name? Or yeah. I feel like you should have given me more information. So it's really hard to play. And it has word puzzles in it. Oh, God. <laughs> so, I mean, I had to play it by looking up how to do it on the internet. Because mm -hmm. it's just impossible to figure it out mm -hmm. on your own. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even really try to make sense of it. It was um, done by Ignition Entertainment, who usually does a pretty bad job of localizing their games. The one game they did that I think is really great is Deadly Premonition. And Deadly Premonition had an English script in Japan. Yeah. So they had their work done for yeah, them. Yeah, because I mean, that seems more like English-centric yeah themes and references yeah well I, I mean the voice acting is all the same in japan as it is oh is that right yeah they oh, were cool. everything was originally recorded so before it came out here if you wanted to play it on the ps3 because the mm -hmm. ps3 was in a region lack system mm -hmm. uh you could import the japanese version and you could still understand the whole game just oh, would cool. have to look up the menus mm -hmm. because all the voice acting was in english you ever played deadly premonition no i haven't played some deadly of my favorite games of oh, all time. Time. Yeah, time yeah it's so good missing out i, I mean I made, I made Josh play it, and I feel like he he hated it a little bit and loved it a little bit. It's definitely not a polished game. Mm -hmm. The well, ending the really kind of... weirded me out. Yeah. And, but I think that was intentional, and I think they they like set up certain things in a way that made the ending this really like a knife twisting in your gut. And I think mm -hmm. that was the point. Yeah. It's a good game. It basically was asking, how do you like them apples? <laughs> FK in the coffee. <laughs> so, I, I mean, are there, you know, it's hard to understand, like, is there a set guideline when it comes to localization? Or are there sort of different approaches? Yeah, or? no, there, there are lots of approaches. And I mean, I think it's tricky to figure out what's the right approach for each game, well, like, for, for an individual game. Like, let me ask you, is there a, sort of a one go-to company that people will kind of turn to? Or is it just uh, the Wild no, West No, I mean, there? there are a lot of different local... And Nintendo usually uses their 
own Nintendo Treehouse or mm-hmm. they use the localization company 84. Okay. And then there are freelance translators like Alexander O. Smith, who is mm-hmm. one of my favorite translators, does a lot of work for Square Enix, but he's a freelancer. Mm. So um he doesn't work for them specifically. He's a closer. Yeah. <laughs> But um, there's so many different approaches, and I think it's really hard to figure out which is right, which approach is right for which game. In the case of Alexander O. Smith, he translated the Ace Attorney series, Mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite game series of all time, Mm -hmm. especially Trials and Tribulations. And that game gets poked fun of a lot for being Mm over-localized because it is a very Japanese game, Mm -hmm. but the American version is set in L.A., (laughs) and they talk about going out for hamburgers all the time. And I think there's (laughs) one instance where you see people like going out and they're very clearly at a Japanese restaurant. They're supposed to be going out for hamburgers. Mm -hmm. But the thing is... They're eating them with chopsticks. Yeah. But the thing is, is that most of the characters in the Ace Attorney series have puns in their names. And in order for that to work, you have to translate everybody's name into English from the beginning. So are you going to translate everybody's name into English and then still have it in Japan and have all these Japanese people with English names? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to translate their names and then change the location and then realize, wait a minute, like now we have to figure out why there are, you know, people living in Shinto temples in (laughs) New LA. Yeah. But uh, it's well, a very good game. Know. It's got it's very comedy heavy, mm-hmm. and they translated the jokes, which is important. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's like um, like a concentrated effort to sort of keep some of that Japanese like quirkiness when they bring games over, or if it's yeah, just and they don't know what the fuck to do? No, know. and I mean Atlas has talked about that how they know most of the audience for their games mm-hmm. does have a broader knowledge of Japanese culture, and so they'll leave things in that other mm-hmm. companies won't. Um, Persona is probably one of the only major series that leaves in honorifics, even in the dub of the game. Hmm. And honorifics are adding, you know, Chan, San, Kun at the end of somebody's name, mm-hmm. which uh, can show certain levels of respect or just relationships between two characters. And right. that's almost always taken out, but it's in Persona 3 and 4. Yeah. Daniel-san, Miyagi-san. <laughs> you know? Which is where most of us became familiar with that idea, mm-hmm. I think. So you like a game like Resident Evil, which I know is a rev, uh, he's, he's like that series. They call it Revident Evil. Revident Evil. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think... Revident Revil, actually. (laughs) Uh, As I'm given to understand it, uh, that kind of fell victim to the other uh, issue that happens with localization, especially, particularly in voice acting, um, is that a lot of times the Japanese will pick English words or phrases that sound good to them, Mm -hmm. absent of whether or not it makes sense as a sentence. Much like any Hollywood 1980s action film writer. Right, exactly. Resident Evil also has English voice acting in Japan. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, so it it had English voice acting. So, like, that's kind of why it fell fell afoul of that. Mm -hmm. Like, some of those lines weren't picked because, you know, that that was the proper dramatic way to... They picked it because... Oh, I like the sound of that, yeah, which is, is something that Japanese has done with English for, for a while. Like uh, in the pro wrestling world, if you look at a lot of puro wrestling, uh, you will find that a lot of their major moves mm-hmm. are just named random shit that sounds good. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the Emerald Frosian is a move, uh, a very popular move, the Burning Hammer, which, yep. you know, like sounds cool, but doesn't mean anything, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like, it doesn't surprise me that they do that in their video games, too. It's just a Japanese. Japanese thing, mm-hmm. which I we do the same thing with uh, Japanese text. People having uh, spirit tattooed on their chest, but really it's bean curd. <laughs> I, thought so. I have an idea for a comedy sketch. This is an aside, but it's like an Asian guy. He's like, "Hey man, look, I got this cool American tattoo," and it says like dildo. And he's like, "What is yeah, that?" thing. Peace, man. It's just peace. You know, it's like uh, there, there's. Also, it's really common to just put random English text on clothing in Japan. Yeah, and yeah. There's this one video, a really cute video of a kid waiting in line to buy a PS4 in Japan, and they ask him if he's getting a PS4 or an Xbox One, and he doesn't know what an Xbox One is. Because of course he doesn't. He's a little kid in Japan yeah. where nobody plays Microsoft consoles, mm-hmm. and he's wearing a hat that says like something ridiculous on it. High oh, voltage. Man. 
He's just a cool kid. It is funnier than high voltage. It says, hope worst not situation. <laughs> oh, cool. Look right. at how cute he is. Hope worst not situation. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's a child. Oh, though. they have, you see like they use English language and like promotions and shit all over or warnings and it's just something is not quite right there i know in china uh not with language but with china treats pabst blue ribbon as if it's you know champagne quality uh liquor well so do hipsters well well, 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 that's part of why well but we all know miller high life is the champagne of beers no i'm not even i'm not even dignifying that by playing it straight well um but like, right, that's, that's, they see that it's a popular beer in the U.S. and they go, oh, it's popular. Mm. It must be fancy. Well, it's one blue ribbons. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean. I need to stand up for Chinese beer drinkers. The Pabst Blue Ribbon that they have there is a completely different beer than the one they have here. It's called Pabst Blue Ribbon 1844, and it's brewed by a different company called CBR Brewing Company, and they just have a licensing agreement with Pabst Blue Ribbon to make beers using their name. It's an actual premium liquor. It's rated very highly by beer advocates, so they think it's a premium liquor because it is a premium liquor there. So, like, that's kind of the the thing with localization, not just with the word spoken, Mm -hmm. but, like, there's there's so much of culture that scans weird it's like you're practically running culture to google translate half the time <laughs> yeah you know because like how do you translate uh like say you you have a game that is made in china how do you translate for an american audience that they're treating paps blue ribbon like you know high quality liquor mm-hmm. like how do you translate that culturally into words that make sense mm-hmm. so that i think that's where a lot of localization uh, quirks and flaws come from it like y- you can't just straight translate because some things don't straight translate. I don't think a lot of people understand that literal translation tends to be inaccurate translation. Mm-hmm. I mean, just for a really basic example, if somebody says in a game uh, like, hey, man, how's it hanging? And then the little tra- the literal translation could be, hello, how are things? But that's not an accurate translation of how that guy speaks or talks. And so people will look at the very basic literal translation of text and then they'll be like look at how much they changed it but they miss on like little quirks of dialect or how this person is saying this in a very rude way or a very cutesy way Mm -hmm. and so the translator is trying to convey the way that they're saying it not just the words that they're saying Mm -hmm. a really good example of that frog from chrono trigger uh-huh. He did not have, you know, the kind of fantasy style knight dialogue in Japan if you do a straight translate. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted Woolsey, who did the translation on that, specifically went with that, as I understood it, because he wanted to get across the kind of, you know, noble personality that this character had. And he felt that was the best way to do it mm-hmm. while having the the dialogue that the game had. Well, he spoke a very old fashioned type of Japanese that's the same thing with okay. Cyan in Final Fantasy VI. And Final Fantasy VI is also translated by, by Ted, Ted Woolsey. Woolsey yeah. mm-hmm. But uh, old-fashioned way of speaking mm-hmm. and used, uh, you know, honorifics that people don't use mm-hmm. anymore. Spoke more like a samurai. I got to imagine humor is probably one of the biggest. Yeah. Like well, puns bringing, are the big thing in. Let's say bringing like a game like Portal to Japan. Yeah. And it's like, how do you even start yeah. with something But like just that? back on Frog also. Mm-hmm. Frog's name is actually uh, Keiru in Japan, which means frog, but it also means means transformed so he has a double meaning and there's no way to translate that so they went with the single meaning frog which works but uh the english retranslation of chrono trigger which is kind of garbage (laughs) but changed his name back to keiru so instead of getting the double meaning you get no meaning yeah you just get a dumb name or uh another really uh well-known situation with like names and stuff uh wario and waluigi yeah. is uh like when you go back to the japanese translation it's a combination of waru which is japanese for bad and then mario or Luigi. like they're literally just calling them bad mario and bad luigi but you know we don't know we don't have the word waru so well it's... wario is a pretty accurate translation because it's a combination of war and mario right and it's also sort of like i don't know you just flip the m upside down and you got this bad version of it. And W also version. is used in Japan to convey like 
powerful because double is pronounced dabaru, which is the same way. Double and W are pronounced the same way in Japanese. What is it? Dabaru. 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 So it's like dabaru mint. Yeah. Dumb? So you'll see like a powerful version of a spell or like an ultimate version of the game. It'll be like mm-hmm. Street Fighter 3 W. And it's supposed okay. to be like double, like twice as cool. So like but sticks that the snakes W. <laughs> yeah, yes, like that. Snakes, w. that. That's the one that turns the whole tree into a snake. <laughs> <laughs> and like, so there'll be stuff with that play on words mm-hmm. that you just can't bring over. But Japanese humor is almost all puns, so it's a nightmare to translate. Which, you know, obviously I love. You have to come up with a completely new pun that still fits the situation. Mm-hmm. Which, again, that should be a field of work that I should be getting into. I think. You should you should, yeah, you should get into yeah. localization. Yeah. But um, in one of the Dot Hat games, I think Dot Hat Mutation, there's a scene where a character is supposed to be doing a bad stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> and then everybody's leaving yeah. really so bad. And they just literally translated it. <laughs> so he's saying, grass is green. The sky is blue. And like these are his jokes. <laughs> and it makes... Carolina. It, looks, it looks so what? surreal when you see it because he's like, here's my comedy tree. Yeah. And then they're like, fish live in the ocean. And it's because the guy is making bad puns and they just sounds like, straight up translated it. Sounds like a Stephen it. Wright act. Fish, uh, fish live in the ocean. I mean, they could have been really lazy and, and been like, what's the deal with fish that live <laughs> in the ocean? And like, it would have translated yeah. then and you would have had to do a small amount of work. Mm-hmm. I think you got to go... Uh, what is the deal with fish living in the ocean? <laughs> um, so, you know, we had mentioned earlier, you know, obviously a lot of things get localized. Film, movies, music. Are games, would you say, is that specifically a medium that's localized more? I, I don't think so. There are certain things that have to be localized in games that don't have to be localized in other types of media, mm-hmm. like gameplay or having text box restrictions. But I mean, everything gets localized. Heavily. I mean, if you've ever seen a kung fu movie, mm-hmm. you know how heavily localized they are. One of the earliest examples of localization is um a French version of a kung Kung Fu movie that was released in the 70s and they completely rewrote the plot Mm -hmm. and made it like political satire (laughs) and they just put a brand new dub and they put an intro like the creator of this work has no idea what we've done. Uh, I can't remember the name because they gave it a really long and pretentious sounding name, deliberately pretentious sounding, I think, Mm -hmm. because that was the joke. I think with games, though, you know, because it's sort of programs, um, you can kind of add extra layers to the localization in a Kung Fu movie, everything is still going to be in Chinese in the background. They might add a subtitle if they show you a sign or something. But with games, I mean, you can just make that McDonald's as opposed to, you know, whatever. whatever. I mean, they'd probably unmake it McDonald's. Like the magic hammer in Link to the Past is called MC Hammer in Japan. And then it says lyrics yeah. to don't touch this after mm-hmm. you pick it up. And they had to take that out when mm-hmm. they brought it over here. Well, it's like Balrog being M. Bison, right? Yeah, like, hey. yeah. They, they, all the Because they were worried about... The, M. Ty- the Mike, Mike Tyson, Tyson suing, so they had to swap names around, and mm-hmm. now people have to use weird names when talking about competitive Street Fighter, mm-hmm. so people don't get confused about characters. But uh, And books get heavily localized, too, and uh, I've been talking to Josh about Lord of the Rings localizations. Oh. And he's sort of fascinated by it. But um, Tolkien was really, really particular about localizations for Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And um, in Sweden, the main translator edited it pretty heavily. Uh, he changed a lot of names so that they'd convey the same meaning. Mm-hmm. And then he edited it a lot for readability. Mm-hmm. And Tolkien hated this guy. Like, he would write letters talking about how conceited and awful he was. Yeah. And the guy's house was burnt down. Mysteriously? He, mysteriously. And uh-huh. he claimed that Tolkien fans did it. And uh-huh. I don't think they ever found who did it. But then Tolkien would get, like, really mad about other translations, too. Like, he would complain about the Dutch translation all the time. And that was actually a really close translation, according to people who spoke English and Dutch. Mm-hmm. But Tolkien, who didn't speak Dutch, was just convinced that they changed all these things. Like, he was super paranoid. And yeah. then it, the translations he liked were the ones in languages where he could read them. <laughs> so he probably was convincing himself that mm-hmm. the stuff was worse than it was. Mm-hmm. But uh, in Sweden, that translation was the only translation of Lord of the Rings for 40 years. And then when they came out with a new, more accurate translation, there was sort of a battle between people who liked the old version better and the new version better. Or like people who are like, oh, I can't wait to read the more accurate version. And they're like, 
like, wait, Tokyo and Jirani is kind of terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Which it is. Yeah. It is, it is. I, I, I hate Tolkien's writing. Great, great storyteller, great world builder, horrible writer. It's just a sausage fest. I mean, That's Tolkien actually. doesn't like, I know it's, it's a callback. Call yeah. but, uh, Hello. I know, it's a callback to my joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's one of those things where I think people convince themselves the version that I can't see is so much better mm-hmm. than the version that I can see. And so they assume that all these things that they don't like are because of localization. Yeah. People will convince themselves that all the stuff they don't like is only there because of localization and that all the stuff that they do like is just stuff that slipped by the localizers and then they might not realize that all these all these witty jokes were added in by the localizers and that all these stupid memes that they think were added in were in the original script too. Mm-hmm. Like the pickle jokes, which are wonderful. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, there's always going to be blow back for anything i think um whether games are more altered or quote-unquote censored now than they had been um, no. i mean look sometimes localization can really fix things sometimes it can go off the rails and uh you know i think the point is is that look i've tried to play games that are in their original form as far as like their language and everything and it's a fucking puzzle game in and of itself just trying to start the goddamn thing Okay, I appreciate it. Sometimes it isn't my cup of tea, but other times it is. You know, I think we've all had some pretty enjoyable experiences, some crazy, wacky things. There's some great hilarity to be had. Uh, But ultimately, you know, if it leads to sort of an influx of games that, you know, come from other parts of the world that you might not otherwise get to play, I think that's a good thing in and of itself. As for me, uh, I always say, you know, for localization, look, don't you know I'm loco? Half Glass Gaming out.